So uh, our next speaker is uh, Bert Garza from Boston College and from Johns Hopkins University. Um, and he has uh, been asked to speak on this very small topic of the role of nutrition and diet in preventing and treating chronic disease. I think it's the disease part that we want him to talk about. Thank you, Ron. Good afternoon and good morning. I decided to sit rather than stand because what I'd like to do is something that is different that's been done by your previous speakers. I'd like to have a conversation with you. I'm extrapolating from my own experience on, on committees and I think that might be the most useful way to use your time. Um, the staff was surprised because I only sent one slide. Uh, which is there, and, and, and I was told the committee has your question, and I said, yes, I know that. Um, it came from them, but the audience doesn't. And so I thought it would be important that as I made some introductory comments, that in fact, you had a context for them. Um, and I was sent two questions by the committee that they would find useful uh, for me to address. One of them had four parts, the other one was a single question, they're, they're on the, uh, the screen there, you can read them. And I'm going to try to provide you with very succinct answers to those two basic questions. But I think that it would be helpful to you to have a context for them. So before I launch into them, let me give you a, a hope, a five minute context of my responses. First, the basic assumption for my responses in terms of the uses of DRIs for dietary guidelines. And I have the conviction, and I think it's one that can be demonstrated on the basis of evidence, that DRIs have been extremely useful, not only domestically, but also globally, in terms of dealing with deficiency diseases. I mean, if we think about the last 100 years, the accomplishments of nutrition science have really been remarkable. Yes, there are some pockets uh, and some deficiency diseases we're still dealing with, but for the most part, we have dealt with them successfully. Imagine a world where nutrition does the same thing for the diet relation part of chronic disease. It's an exciting one as I think about it, and DRIs, my conviction, can play the same role in dealing with that dimension of the nutritional issues that we now play. So that's why I accepted the role of, of chair to the committee uh, assignment and report that you, you probably have read already. Uh, accepting that, that, uh, that task of, of chairing that group, I want to acknowledge that both Stephanie and, and Jamie were, were on the committee. Uh, Joseph and others uh, uh, in the audience, I'm sure, helped uh, in trying to resolve many of the questions that we had. So that's, that's the conviction that DRIs are going to be helpful. You and I can disagree on whether that conviction is, is, a, is one that one can, um, can defend. The caveat, however, is that I tried my best to focus my remarks on the uses of DRIs for dietary guidelines. But you have to remember that DRIs are developed for multiple uses. Uh, dietary guidance is only one of them, or, or guidelines rather, is only one of those many uses. I hope that your committee is also thinking very carefully about what the use of the dietary guidelines are. Because depending on what use you put them to, then, and I hope it, it, there's a, a good communication between this committee and the DRI framework committee, because depending on your conversations and theirs, you could influence each other uh, and the product of each committee could be much stronger. Um, and traditional uses of DRIs, I think, are going to change. And perhaps the uses of dietary guidelines should also change. But, but having a discussion up front about the uses is very key. And I made some assumptions about uses that perhaps are unwarranted and that probably will be uh, uh, evident as, as, I, as I speak. Key, uh, many of the issues that we dealt with uh, 
in terms of trying to think through the problems and issues that relate to the use of chronic disease endpoints in developing DRIs, uh, as I thought about it, really apply also to dietary guidelines. Um, how should we deal with prevailing demographics? The idea that dietary guidelines relate only to healthy populations is going to be pretty irrelevant pretty soon because, in fact, the minority of, popu of, of the North American population may not be healthy, at least if you define health using weight status. So, so thinking about the traditional way we thought about DRIs and dietary guidance, uh, I think, will be terribly important. Um, much of the thinking of healthy populations or about healthy populations as we develop DRIs and we develop dietary guidelines continues to govern our thinking today. And I do think that it's incumbent upon us as we think about both DRIs and dietary guidelines to think with another framework in mind. People like me over the age of 65 uh, are growing in unprecedented rates. Um, we usually stopped in the past at age 51. Uh, I didn't go back to check demographics, but I suspect that you will be omitting at least a third or 40 percent of the population if we continue to do that. How, you know, we always have thought about DRIs and dietary guidance in terms of the relationship between nutrients and diets. Then that was appropriate. It still is appropriate, but perhaps not as appropriate because of the un unprecedented abilities to modify the composition of food and modify our diets. The constraints of what nature did no longer should hold us back in trying to think through those issues and having the diet and its normal composition constrain the development of either a DRI or dietary guidelines. Um, how should we deal with the whole issue of deficiency diseases uh, being fairly simple in the sense that, that if you supplied the missing nutrient, that was both necessary and sufficient to correct the condition. With chronic disease, that no, not, no longer is the case. They may be neither necessary nor sufficient, not if you adopt a risk reduction model, a relative risk reduction model, which I think we have to do if we're dealing with chronic disease. Well, think about the implications of that statement for dietary guidelines. Uh, and I think that if one spends a few minutes thinking about that, you're, uh, the task can become quite daunting. Um, and then lastly, I'm among the, 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 the crazy group of scientists, I think, that, that are really enamored by the idea of personalized medicine, not be or precision medicine, not because we have all the answers, but because I do think that technology is getting us closer to that. Well, how can that technology help personalizing dietary guidelines? Uh, is the printed version of what we give the public really the best we can do in the 21st century? And what are the implications for how you use DRIs and how we develop dietary guidelines um, if, in fact, that becomes a goal? Now, throughout this previous experience that I alluded to very briefly uh, earlier, of chairing this group that looked at using chronic disease endpoints. I had to find, I found myself perhaps ad nauseum, I'm looking at Steph again and Jamie, reminding people not to limit ourselves by what we knew today. What we know today, we, I hope, is going to change very dramatically tomorrow as it has throughout our careers. Well, we can usually get stuck because if I answer the first question, about what, what is the science, or where is the science on basing dietary recommendations on chronic disease endpoints, I have to say stunted is where we are. Um, why do I use that, that word? I was quite humbled when I went back to read the 1994 report in preparation for the task we just completed. And if you go back that on how should DRIs be or how should RDAs be, be modified? I forget the, the exact title. But when I went back to read it and read the summaries of the stakeholder input, I had a Dorian Gray moment. What do I mean by that? All the problems were just as vigorous as they had been 25 years ago. 
The people tackling them were aging, present company excluded, I suppose. <laughs> but it was, really, it was really humbling. I mean, that we, we really have not made much progress in moving some of those key questions uh, off the uh, uh, center stage. Uh, they still continue to haunt us. Uh, we still are worried about how we measure dietary intakes objectively for individuals. I think all of us are, are, are more or less satisfied. We can do that for populations reasonably well. The development of qualified biomarkers continues to haunt us, both for present but long-term health. Tracking indicators longitudinally continues to haunt us. And how we handle complex interacting etiologies continues to haunt us. None of those are new to this presentation. They're all in that 1994 report. And I suspect that they're back in the, the late 1980 report on diet and health. So the, the challenges are significant. It's not because none of us have been working, but it does give us a sense of how daunting that first question is. Now, when I say it's stunted, uh, it doesn't mean that we don't know anything. There's, there is lots of information. Uh, a number of RCTs have been done. Uh, there are a number of observational studies that have been done uh, since the last DRI review. And I suspect that as DRI's reviews continue that you're going to see that reflected in future reviews, so that in fact we will be moving it forward. What I think we have to be much better at, and a challenge for this group, will be indeed how we more accurately portray the precision with which we know things. Will we know things with the precision that we want across the board? No. That was one of the chief conclusions our group came up with. But the fact that we didn't have the ideal RCT for every single study we would like doesn't mean that we can do nothing. Because if nature abhors a vacuum, nutrition science probably abhors one even more, and somebody will come in to fill it. And I promise, I think I can promise, that whatever fills it is going to be a lot worse than the more nuanced judgments that scientific bodies can make. And so we shouldn't be stymied if we don't know everything but we should be upfront in terms of trying to estimate what the precision of, of, of what we know. Now, is the science stronger for um, non-essential nutrients than essential nutrients? And if anything, I think it's weaker. Everything that I, 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 I've said, uh, I think, can, can get exaggerated if one considers non-essential nutrients, particularly because we don't even have standards of identity for many of these. Uh, our compositional tables are even worse than they are for, for nutrients. Uh, and so that the challenge that we face in looking at the connection between non-essential nutrients and chronic diseases, or even our, our food substances, are much greater, uh, in my mind, than the challenges we face for the essential nutrients. So part B uh, of the question is, is the science stronger for the prevention of chronic disease or um, the amelioration of disease after it has already occurred. Well, in theory, most DRIs in the past have been developed as primary prevention reference mar uh, values. I do think that your question is a very valid one, because I do think that in the future, DRIs probably have to be developed if we're going to be looking at chronic disease for both primary and secondary prevention. Um, but what that framework is going to be for doing that needs to be given much more thought we tried in our report to lay out the options that our group uh, came up with. Luckily, we weren't tasked with coming up with a recommendation or to reach consensus uh, on, on any of those options. Um, but to the degree that, in fact, there was um, any consensus views expressed, uh, my sense was that, in fact, most people agreed with the idea that future DRIs had to do more than just primary prevention uh, as a goal. Uh, that if we're going to deal with chronic disease, we had to look at secondary prevention as well. Um, so this uh, um, third brings me to the third point. Uh, is the science stronger for basing DRIs on food recommendations on chronic disease endpoints? And omega-3 fatty acids versus fish intake was the example that the committee forwarded. My judgment, and I think the judgment of the group that the, the Health Canada and the U.S. government put together, was that the, the strongest evidence we have relates to dietary patterns rather than specific nutrients. 
But I would add that there was also a strong sense and other lifestyle factors associated with those particular patterns. That it's very difficult to disassociate the two. I, it just, uh, and, and I would challenge anyone to say that that isn't a correct statement. It's hard to disassociate the two from any observational study. So yes, I agree that there's better data for fish intake than omega-3s, but I'm not even certain in my own scientific mind if it's fish intake or if it's fish intake plus. Um, there are exceptions to that. Uh, I think that if we all look at the, at the Mediterranean uh, uh, diet uh, investigations done by Estrick and, and, and his colleagues in Europe, um, the DASH study here in the US, that there are information that we have that relate to diets uh, that we can, I think, with confidence ascribe to the diet. But they tend to be the exception rather than, rather than the rule. Um, so it is, a, it is possible, uh, there is an alternative uh, to the, uh, uh, the explanation that, gee, we just don't know because of these confounding factors, that in fact we have been getting a, a, and ignoring a recurring message that the health benefits that we associate with these diets and, and, and lifestyle changes are the consequence of multiple components in, in our food supply interacting with multiple regulatory points, all to a small degree. Uh, if you look at many of the GWAS studies that have been done, major effects have not been found for very many associations. Uh, and perhaps that's the recurring message. Uh, and so that there will be no magic bullets. Uh, and if that's the case, then dietary guidance, dietary guidelines um, will become even more important than they have been. Um, so then, um, moving on then uh, to D, where do we stand now on considering chronic disease endpoints as useful markers for diet recommendations? Um, well, the challenges are formidable. I don't, I don't think that, I, I wish I could give you uh, uh, the encouraging signal that in fact you missed something in your own deliberation, <laughs> because I suspect that's the same conclusion you've already come to as a group. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't know anything. It just means that the challenges are formidable, that we have a body of observational studies we can use, uh, and we have some RCTs, both positive and negative, that we can use. Um, and at least if you go back to the report that, that, uh, that's just been published, it represents, I think, a first attempt at listing options of how you deal with inadequacies in our database. Um, and moving the, the, the whole field forward um, in, a, in a positive way. Importantly, I think that that report gave research agendas a very short shrift. I think we could have done a better job. Uh, and I certainly would hope that your committee does a better job than we've done traditionally uh, in reports of this kind, because the research that we have to do probably is the most important aspect of, of any deliberation at, at this point. So then the, the second question um, is, what is the connection between DRIs and DGA? And could this relationship be strengthened? If so, how? In my view, DRIs and DGAs are, fill different but very complementary functions. Um, and I can't imagine doing DGAs without DRIs. Uh, because at some point, you need to look at the nutrient adequacy from a deficiency perspective of any diet pattern that you suggest. The nice things about having DRIs is that you can assess multiple dietary patterns against those standards and decide how many or how few, uh, in fact, are compatible with, with uh, sufficiency. Um, so I, I don't see it as an either or. How can they be strengthened? Again, I don't have a... a, a a very complex response, and that's by strengthening the DRIs and strengthening your own database on looking at the causal links between diet and chronic diseases. So it's a rather straightforward one. One can then go into much greater detail if you consider specific diseases and outcomes. But let me stop there, because I already took five more minutes than I wanted to. Um, I wanted to leave you at least 15 minutes for, um, for questions or, or comments. 
So thank you again, Rob, for the opportunity to share these, uh, some of the work that we did together with, with Jamie and, and, and Stephanie.